Hello! My name is Ingela Tegel and I'm going to talk about the Swedish opera singer Jenny Lind, my research on her and the biography that I wrote about her. I'm a researcher in musicology and my speciality is opera voice technique in the 19th century and I'm going to tell you a little bit briefly about myself first. I have a background as a singer. I am a high lyric slash coloratura soprano. I graduated as singer in 1998 in Gothenburg and after that I made my living on singing for about 10 years. In 2008 I started my research career as a PhD student in Örebro and my thesis was about Jenny Lind and especially her voice qualities, her aesthetics, techniques and her timbre. And I presented this dissertation, Jenny Lind, the impact of her voice on media identity in October 2013. And after this, I got a three-year international postdoc position at the Bern University of Arts in Switzerland. During these three years, I investi investigated the vocal school of Jenny Lind's well-known teacher, Manuel Garcia the Younger. I conducted vocal experiments together with seven sopranos to investigate how the Garcia school affect female opera singers. And after this, I wrote a biography of Jenny Lind. Jenny Lind was born 1820. So last year, 2020, she had 200 years anniversary. As several singers during the 19th century, she got the nickname Nightingale in Swedish Nektergal. So I named my book Nektergalen and it was published last year by Natur och Kultur. As you may know, Jenny Lind had a most spectacular career. She managed to launch herself and her image as pure femininity. She actually became a sort of representation of the gorgeous femininity. And with this image, she became incredibly popular. And what has fascinated me the most is how this was possible in the first half and in the middle of the 19th century. Jenny Lind lived in a time when women actresses, opera singers and all women who worked on stages were seen as sexually available, sometimes even more or less as prostitutes. To show yourself officially on stage was not compatible with the imagination of femininity. In my dissertation, I ran a thesis in three parts. First, Jenny Lind wanted to make distance from her miserable childhood and the fact that her mother was not married when Jenny was born. And to launch herself as exceptionally feminine was a part of this distance making. Number two, two roles that she played in her early youth was helping her in this direction. And third, and main part of my thesis, was that her voice character contributed to her image. In the biography of the Nightingale, I have tried to describe the three parts in a more popular version, and I also put these three theses linearly into her life. Her unhappy childhood made her insecure, she was ambivalent in her relationship to the stage and she constantly sought support from women and men in older generations so, uh, as mother and father figures. The media creation, Jenny Lind, got big support from the journalism of this new age. Around 1830, media started to write about the actresses behind the rose and they were especially interested in the women actresses. 
And often media did not separate the role character from the actress private life. So the image often became a mix between the roles they played and their private personalities. And of course, also, her voice was a crucial part of how she was able to launch herself. She had a voice damage that I'm soon going to talk more about. Jenny Lind came from relatively poor conditions. She was an illegitimate child. Her mother was not married when she gave birth to her. And the mother also gave her away immediately after she was born. And after this, Jenny moved between several guardians before she was 10 years old. In September 1830, Jenny was accepted, accepted as pupil at the Swedish Royal Theatre in Stockholm. And this is the first time her surname, Lind, was mentioned in the sources. She started to study with singing teacher Carl Magnus Kraelius, but when he retired just a few months later, Lind got a new singing teacher, Isaac Berry, and she studied with Isaac Berry for six years. And already in November 1830, she made her debut as a child actress. When she was 11 years old, she got attention in the Stockholm Press who mentioned her as a prodigy. A couple of years later, when she was 15 years old, she got her first opera role in Adolf Fredrik Lindblad's Frondörerna. Though now there are some indications that something had happened to her voice, that she got an injury. Lindblad himself wrote to a friend Jenny Lind was a marvellous actress, but her voice was weak and poor. And this is the first time Lind's voice damage is mentioned in a sources. She managed to recover this time, but still this would follow her for the rest of her career. Nevertheless, Lind managed to make a big breakthrough as Agathe in Weber's Der Freischütz, the 7th of, 7th of March 1838, at the age of 17. And this is the first time her media image as pure femininity is mentioned in the Stockholm press. And during the following two years, media established her image by mixing up her private personality with two main roles, Agathe, and another role, Alice, in Meyerbeer's opera, Robert le Diable. The stories in these operas are similar. It is about struggle between evil and good, and the role characters Agathe and Alice represents each opera's pure virgin who saves the male main character by her virginity. Agathe was Lynn's breakthrough and Alice established her as a star. Later on, in 1891, Lynn's biographers Holland and Rockstraw wrote that the characters of Agathe and Alice brought out Lynn's personality, her passion for noble purity. But I consider it was the opposite. I write in my biography. Perhaps it was the opposite, that it was the roles that created the image of Jenny Lind, that she was so convincing in these roles that media mixed her personality with the roles. Nevertheless, it is not a coincidence that her media profile appears during these two years. After the breakthrough, Lind's successes followed each other and she became the Stockholm Royal Theatre's prima donna assoluta. But with the successes, the requirements increased and this took hard on her voice that became more and more tired. Her voice damage was shown more often and this is also obvious in the press. 
her colleague at the Royal Opera Theatre, uh, the Italian baritone singer Giovanni Belletti, told her about the singing teacher at the Paris Conservatory, Manuel Garcia. And Jenny made plans for a long visit in Paris, 1848-42. Before I talk about her study with Garcia, I would like to stop and try to sort out what was wrong in her technique. Why did she, did she damage her voice? Later on, again Holland and Rockstor accused the Royal Theatre for having her singing two demanding roles too often and too early in life. A quick look in the archives denies that she sang too often. She acted on stage about 60 to 70 times per year and with a healthy voice technique that would not have been a problem. And when one speaks about two demanding roles, it depends on how you define a demanding role. Today, opera singers' debuts are much later than in Jenny Lind's time but one cannot really refer to that. Today, we associate opera singing with a mature, perhaps more dark timbre than in Jenny Lynn's time. And to progress this mature voice, the vocal cords needs to be fully grown. And this is, not normal. this is normally not the case at the age of 15, 16, as was the normal age of an opera debut in the mid 19th century in Stockholm and in the whole Europe. But this mature timbre was not the opera aesthetic by the 19th century or earlier. The young girls at Europe's opera scenes did not push themselves to be mature. They made their debuts singing with their young girl voices. And doing so, it is not harmful to sing technically difficult parts. So, why did Jenny Lind damage her voice? There are some indications in her teacher Isaac Berry's notes. Isaac Berry was still young and unexperienced during those six years that he taught Jenny Lind. So, first, he placed the chest voice quite high, up to a G in the first octave. And that can be compared to Garcia, who placed it not more than an E in the first octave, one and a half tone lower. And also Jenny Lind's later colleague Isidor Danström confirms that the young Jenny Lind pushed her chest voice high. The second issue, is that Isaac Bay considered Jenny Lind to be a mezzo-soprano. And this is probably a huge mistake. Later sources, international reviews, talks about her as a very high and soft, uh, a very high soprano with a soft voice and a bright timbre, characteristic for a high lyric coloratura soprano. And it is possible that Isaac Bay in the belief that Jenny Lind was a mezzo-soprano had her sing in too low tessituras. And thirdly, Isaac Bay had some strange ideas that he mentioned as consequence notes. He claimed that neither the pupil nor the teacher should work with notes higher than F, sometimes maybe G, in the second octave. He mentioned all higher notes as consequence notes that he believed would come by themselves by working in lower notes. Obviously, one should not overwork the high register with young girls, but this might have, have had serious consequences to Jenny Lind not being able to work at all with her highest register together with an experienced teacher since her roles demanded a higher tessitura. Jenny Lind got help from Manuel Garcia. She went to Paris in 1841 and had lessons for 10 months and Garcia was able to help her. After these 10 months, 
her voice damage was limited to three notes, F, G, A, in the first octave. In this range, she still leaked air for the rest of her life, and this indicates that she had a lump on her vocal cords, that the vocal cords were not able to close tightly enough in this specific range. So, what technique did she got from Garcia then? How did Jenny Lind sound? As a singer, this is something I find most interesting, and I would like to try, at least briefly, to explain my research on this topic. Jenny Lind and Garcia both lived in a paradigm shift of vocal techniques. Approximately in the mid-19th century, older aesthetics were replaced by newer. And since, since this was before recording technology breakthrough, it is possible that today we would not recognize this at all as opera singing. Opera technique was developed by and for castrato singers in the early 17th century. The aesthetic by then implied lots of fast coloraturas and embellishments varied with a beautiful melody delivered with a bright, brilliant tune quality, employing no or at least less vibrato than today. Garcia taught this brilliant florid style, which had dominated the opera scene for approximately 200 years. But during his lifetime, its popularity declined. Romanticism demanded a new heroic singing style with long dramatic lines, which replaced the coloraturas. Also, orchestras and opera houses grew larger, and this required more voice volume, and the singers were pushed to invent new techniques in order to be heard. As Garcia's pupil, Janilin counts as one in the last generation of opera singers that used the older technique even if they sometimes mixed it with newer techniques. Garcia, he was considered as old-fashioned. That was also the case of Jenny Lind, to some extent at least. And I would like to talk about what was the difference between today's opera singing and Garcia's and Jenny Lind's vocal techniques and their aesthetics. There are mainly three techniques that differs from today's opera singing. First of all, the larynx position. The sound that we associate with opera singing today is based on a lowered larynx position. In Garcia's terms, that would be voix sombre, dark voice. This gives a dark, mature sound and it also tends to give more vibrato than the higher larynx position that Garcia termed voix blanche, bright voice. Opera singers today are trained only in the low larynx position, but that has not always been the case. Before the 19th century, the vocal schools did not talk about larynx positions and the evidence indicates that opera singers did not fix their larynx in any particular position. Their larynx followed the tune up and down. But in the 1830s, some tenors experimented with a fixed lower larynx. The purpose was to increase a heroic sound that also would be heard through a bigger orchestra. And by the end of the 19th century, this lowered larynx position replaced the higher, that extinct. We have some evidence from Jenny Lind's colleague Isidor Danström again, that Jenny Lind was very skilled in switching position of her larynx. The second technique concerns breathing. During the 19th century, the focus on breathing went lower, down in the body. In the beginning and before the 19th century, inhalation was focused to the upper part of the chest and also to the clavicular part. 
But during the same time as the larynx position went lower, so did the breathing and the inhalation focus shifted from the chest to the abdominal parts of the body. Uh, and that is what we call breath support today. The lower breath support also aimed to create a more vigorous sound. Garcia, he advocated something in between with focus on the lower part of the chest, but not at all at the abdominal muscles. The third technique is Garcia's controversial term coup de la glotte. And this concerns the glottal closure. There are three ways of closing the glottis in opera singing. Aspired, simultaneous and explosive. And the most common today is the simultaneous. Though Garcia propagated and termed the explosive uh, closure. That means that the vocal cords closes before vocation and then it explodes like if you hit them as in coughing or in laughing. This technique had been dominant for about 200 years but in the mid 19th century it was also on its way out of fashion. For a long period during the 20th century this explosive vocation has been banned. But lately we have rediscovered it and it actually functions very well if the vocal cords are leaking air. Jenny Lind's other teacher Isaac Berry confirms that Lind used this explosive technique to cover her damage, her veiled range in her first octave. During her stay in Paris, Jenny Lind made an audition for Meyerbeer, who was the director at the Royal Opera in Berlin. Meyerbeer was impressed, but he did not have anything for her yet, but he would return quite soon. Jenny Lind went home to Stockholm again in the autumn 1842. And the Stockholm press claimed that she now was at the same level as any world artist. After two years, Meyerbeer engaged her to Berlin, and this was her big international breakthrough, and it took place in December 1844. After this debut in Berlin, she travelled and sang around Europe, and her reputation increased. She now was one of the world-famous opera stars. When she came to London, 1847, the phenomena Lindmania was a fact. During the years 1844 to 47, Lind had a good friend, Louise Johansson, as companion on the journey. They had known each other since their childhood, and Louise wrote a diary during this time. And this is a unique insight in Jenny Lind's daily life and in her personality. In the diary, we are able to follow them day by day through Germany, Austria to Vienna, to London and through England. Thanks to Louise's diaries, we get to know Jenny Lind behind the scene. Of course, she got exhausted of all the traveling, rehearsals, new faces and new places all the time. And she also suffered from anxious that her voice would not be good enough. Lind was terrified each time she had a debut in a new town or at a new scene. Louise handled her before her premieres when she sometimes even got aggressive. This was not easy for Louise to handle and she also was quite depending on Jenny Lind. After four and a half years on tour, Lind suddenly decided to end her great opera career and henceforward sing only in concerts. In May 1849, she acted for the last time at stage. This was in London. But only one year later, she accepted a contract 
of a two-year tour in America from the American show and businessman P.T. Barnum. Jenny Lind was now at the peak of her career and when she now met an American skilled marketer, the Jenny Lind mania really increased. When she arrived at the port of New York, no less than 30,000 people greeted her and this continued. Everywhere she came, thousands of people wanted to have a glimpse of her. Several times she needed to sneak away and hide from her fans. Sometimes she even needed police escort. Until 1847-48, Lind had run an ordinary but fairly generous charity. But in America, she increased this. In America, the charity was even more important than in Europe, and Barnum used Lind's generosity in his marketing. He also got help from manufacturers who used Lind's name. Modists dedicated her hats, coats, dresses, and even furniture such as chairs, couches, and pianos got her name. And Jenny Lind was shocked over all gifts she got. This America tour was the peak of Lind's spectacular career. And in the end of the trip, she found the man she married, her pianist Otto Goldschmidt. They married uh, on the 5th of February, 1852 in Boston. She wrote in a letter to a friend that she could not have a better life partner. Maybe this marriage was quite sober, without passion, but still it was a happy marriage. Otto became the faithful friend that Lind had longed so long for. Later in 1852, they moved back to Europe, first to Dresden, but after five years, they settled down in London, where they stayed for the rest of their lives. They got three children, Walter, Jenny and Ernst. Jenny Lind and Otto Goldschmidt continued their tours around Europe and they gave concerts quite often in the 1850s and also in the beginning of the 1860s, but then more seldom. And it must also be said, as Madame Goldschmidt, she never got that spectacular attention as when she performed as the unmarried Jenny Lind. Jenny Lind died from cancer, 1887, at the age of 67 years. And I will end this by saying thank you very much for listening and I really hope you have enjoyed. Bye!